Thanks guys for coming for the second webinar of this nine webinar series of Digital Leads Club Growth Conference 2020. So we have Paul Randall, who is the digital direct digital director for Axonabel and worked for uh, other companies such as Visa. He has a breadth of marketing and digital experience which spans many, many years. And um, he's talking about a really interesting subject today, which is digital with purpose. So building post-COVID digital resilience. Um, so Paul will be talking um, in a presentation. So he'll give, give a presentation um, for around about 20 minutes to half an hour. And feel free, guys, so if you have any questions, interrupt Paul throughout and we'll dive straight in. So it's a really interactive session. Um, if not, we'll pick up at the very end and answer any questions you may have. Um, but I'll pass over to Paul to kick us off and I um, hope everyone enjoys. Brilliant. Thanks, Jack. And um, hi to everybody. And thanks to um, all the um, comments coming in about my background. I didn't realise that my little man cave was quite so um, interesting. But um, I have to say that um, I'm far more practiced at marketing in digital than I am on the on the Les Paul at the moment. Nowadays. It just sits there looking pretty and gathering dust, I'm afraid. Um, and much as I'd love to talk about that, um, as Jack said, what I'm planning to talk to you about today is uh, about digital with purpose um, and about how maybe using that can help us build more resilience into our digital plans and digital worlds um, post COVID-19 as we come out of COVID-19. And you know, the reason why uh, I'd like to talk to you about that is twofold. I mean, I'm a marketer, uh, as Jack said, with lots of experience. Um, you know, started off in the early days in the very first dot com, um, launching search engines and um, SaaS services when they were called application service provision. I then spent almost a decade running Windows and Microsoft before turning my hand into digital transformation. Yet, at the same time, I've also had a, a passion for sustainability and, and for the environment. As you can see, I'm a bit of a cyclist, but some of the cycling things um, behind me. But early, early on in my career, um, I was lucky enough to be working for the British Dance Institution and worked with people like Jonathan Poet, who launched or founded um, Friends of the Earth uh, and UN environmentalists to actually launch ISO 14001. I've volunteered on numerous kind of volunteer um, sustainability kind of things across the years, such as condor conservation treks in Patagonia or marine conservation programs in Honduras. And it's been a second part of my life, a passion for sustainability. And about nine months ago, um, my 11 year old daughter um, walks up to me, gives me a hug after I get off a conference call and asks me if my job is good for the environment. And I suddenly realized that whilst I was kind of passionate for uh, sustainability in the environment and things of that nature, I wasn't necessarily living and breathing it in, in my job and in my corporate world. Um, subsequently, I kind of subscribed to a course with Cambridge University and their Centre for Sustainability Leadership, uh, and I've just come out the back of that course. And my personal mission now is to start bringing marketing and sustainability together, um, because my personal perspective is that whilst other parts of our corporate environments, such as supply chain, manufacturing, operations, have probably been doing a lot around sustainability. Um, for a number of years now, marketing and digital is a bit behind the curve. And some of that um, lack of attention is becoming thin ice that's being exposed as we go through COVID and requires us to maybe take a step back and look at different ways to approach digital and marketing going forward. And as Jack said, I want this to be a discussion. Um, this deck is very new. It's something I'm working on as a piece of thought leadership. Um, I'm being deliberately provocative as I dive into that. So if you disagree, great. Um, that said, all the stats that I'm going to give you are fully referenced. And if everybody wants references at the end, please, please do let me know. Um, so I'm going to quickly share my screen. Uh, if Jack, you can confirm me, you can see everything there. Yep. No, I can see everything. And, and just leading on what you just mentioned then as well, guys, um, tomorrow we'll be sending out an email with all those different points that Paul mentioned, um, just with all the relevant links 
and um, his, his LinkedIn profile if he wants to carry on the conversation offline. But yeah, Paul, I can see all that. Brilliant, excellent. Okay, so that's, that's a bit, a bit, bit of me um, and why I'm focused around sustainability and digital and all those sorts of things. Um, but before we get into today, uh, I'm going to set the scene a little bit by going a little bit back in time. So around about the mid-90s when um, I was uh, just about getting into, into tech marketing at that point in time, but my, um, my, my partner at the time was actually a genetic microbiologist at um, Oxford University and was actually specializing in, of all things, in an infectious disease. And she used to um, scare the living daylights out of me, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> on a daily basis with some of the things that she was seeing and some of the stories she was hearing from the community she was working with. And then one day um, I was sat in the office and she had to call me and she had to call me on the work phone because there were no mobile phones at that point in time um, to say that she'd been sent home from work and she'd been sent home from work because she'd been growing a, a sample dish um, from a, some, an individual that had travelled into the UK from South America and, and who was currently in the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, um, very, very ill and she'd been given one of uh, a sample of some sort from that individual and trying to figure out what was wrong with him and turns out she'd been growing the bubonic plague in a petri disc on the desk in front of her for three days um, and they figured out that that's what it was and they sent her home whilst they figured out what to do with this situation to which i was quite alarmed about because I thought hold on this is very contagious um, so why are they sending you home why haven't they locked you away in a room somewhere um, but thankfully it turned out there's two versions of the bubonic plague and the one that um, my partner had been growing was actually the less dangerous one and not so contagious so it wasn't actually an issue but the point was and the point I'm seeking to make is that actually the scientific community um, has been throwing warning signs out about um, the potential for a global pandemic for decades. Uh, at the same time as um, this story happened, a book had just come out called The Coming Plague, which is a fascinating read if any of you want to look at it, which was predicting exactly what we're seeing today. And actually Bill Gates in 2015 did a TED talk about the fact that the, UK, uh, the, the world isn't actually ready for a respiratory infection or pandemic such as actually we're seeing today. So, you know, the community, the scientific communities out there are telling us to get ready for these sorts of things. And, you know, that's all well and good to do at this point in time, um, but it's something that we should start to pay more attention to. The other thing that the scientific community is telling us nowadays is that despite all the horror and all the, the sadness and the grief, that's coming with COVID, actually, this is a, a warning shot from nature. You know, um, there's a growing community within the, the sustainability community that talk about it as a test run light. You know, for all the horror that it's given us and for the impact it's having on our lives, it could have been far worse. If it had been Ebola that had broken out, if the pay, plague had re, um, reappeared, in our lives, we could be in a far, far worse um, scenario than we are actually today. So that gives us, in a way, uh, a couple of opportunities. First of all, it allows us to take a real view of our collective abilities to cope with the sorts of system shocks that we're seeing at the moment with COVID-19. But then also, it's a, and probably more importantly, it's a test of how ready and willing we are to actually change our behaviours now so that A, and ideally we can mitigate those shocks so they don't actually become that bad, so we flatten the curve of future system level shocks, or if we don't manage to mitigate them, we're actually ready for when those things actually start to come. Now, you know, that all seems to make sense to me, but what I really want to stress actually it is that's not me being some sort of hippie tree hugger that's me looking at this very much from a business lens and from a business perspective um, yes i'm passionate about the environment but i'm also passionate about society i'm also passionate about 
commerce and industry being the way that we actually drive sustainable change. So actually, I want to focus this on actually what are the benefits that come out of these scenarios we're in at this moment in time. So let's take a quick look at the kind of financial and the economic impacts of system level shocks and what they might actually mean to us. So the Oxford University is saying at the moment that the potential negative impact of COVID-19 is something in the region of $2.7 trillion. And obviously we're seeing that happen in real time um, as we go forward at this moment in time. However, the, um, the Global Commission on Adaption to, to Climate Change, which is led by um, Bill Gates, actually says that if we want to avoid um, climate change, we need to be investing 1.8 trillion. So already you can see that by being proactive in these scenarios, we can actually avoid a lot of the costs that we're seeing at the moment on the back of um, COVID-19. You know, at the moment, COVID-19 is already more expensive than avoiding climate changes, and the impact of climate change on us could be massively more significant than COVID is at this moment in time. The most important thing I think, though, that the, um, the Global Commission are actually saying with their 1.8 trillion, though, whilst it will cost us that to avoid climate change, the actual upside far outweighs that investment. And actually the benefits we could see from an economic point of view are in the region of $7 trillion. And that comes from numerous sources. That could be um, new products, new services, new, um, new markets that are created to actually put technologies and, and put things in place to avoid climate change. It can also be avoiding things like massive insur insurance payouts because there haven't been massive storms or massive floods or things of that sort of nature. But from a business point of view, just looking at the opportunity of $7 trillion coming out of an investment of $1.8 trillion has got to be an exciting thing for us to focus on and far more positive thing for us to focus on than actually the knee-jerk reaction of trying to find $2.7 trillion to actually accommodate COVID-19. So what we need to do is actually start thinking about, okay, so if sustainability, if these system level shocks are going to come in impactors, and on the one hand, they could be massively negative, but on the other hand, they could be massively positive, we need to start breaking that down into what impacts they have on business and how we can start looking at them individually so we can build out plans to actually be proactive and benefit from them. And what was really interesting about this chart that I've put in front of you here when I was doing my course with Cambridge was that actually um, we were working through this and understanding how this model actually works pretty much as COVID um, was happening in real time around us. And it was amazing how applicable this model actually became to the COVID world. And hopefully as you look across it there, you would agree with me. You know, in the COVID-19 reactive world, we have seen massive price volatility. You know, whether it's toilet rolls or hand sanitizer, uh, from a, a consumer point of view, you've seen prices go up and down. But more importantly, within the supply chain, uh, availability of products and services that go into your eventual services, means that your own ability to price and maintain profitability is massively impacted. One of the big companies that's um, already feeling the pain of this scenario has been Apple, with its dependency on China for um, its manufacturing and things of that nature. Obviously, organizational disruption is why we're doing this um, remotely, rather than all being you know, face to face at this point in time. Um, that obviously, has a massive impact on productivity and those sorts of things, but can also massively impact profit. Amazon has you know, now infamously been running around the world trying to recruit an extra 100,000 individuals. That's not something that you normally do and is gonna have a massive impact on you know, your profitability at the end of the year and those sorts of things. You know, that impact on productivity is something we're seeing at the moment as well. It also has a massive impact on just how engaged your employees are with you by how you actually treat them. Uh, and there's been good and bad kind of stories about that going on in all our press over the last few weeks. Um, great stories, you know, around 
um, companies allowing employees to work from home, empowering them to work from home. Um, I think it's Microsoft saying, no, Google's saying now that it's going to let employees work from home if they want to, to the end of the year. And yet you also have the flip side of that, where you have people like Weatherspoons just telling their employees to go and get a job in a supermarket and not really caring about them. You know, the way you're responding at this point in time has a big impact on how your kind of people and your employees actually view you as an organization, um, which is going to become important in the longer term. Equally, there's been the same impact on top of brand reputation. Organizations such as Pret um, did extremely well by sort of saying they're going to give away some of their food to the NHS staff and to key workers and things of that sort of nature. And on the flip side of that, you're seeing some companies just kind of revert to kind of very thin veneer sentimental brand videos that say how they're there to care for you but that's all they're doing there's no actual kind of skin in the game on that um and i don't know if any of you've seen the video that's going around linkedin at the moment where um, a video editor has taken about 10 or 12 different corporate brand videos that have appeared in response to covid19 and actually splice them all together and actually they all say exactly the same thing they all use exactly the same words over and over again so you can take the brand out of those videos which are highly produced and look beautiful but actually the message that they're becoming comes a little bit false and a little bit thin in that context in comparison to organizations that are changing their actual manufacturing to supply personal protective equipment or to get um, you know services into kind of NHS communities and actually putting real skin in the game. In a more well actually I was going to say in the more medium term but actually one of the things that COVID has driven as well has been the, the rapid acceleration of business but many business models have had to pivot very quickly under this current scenario with COVID-19. Personally I've been volunteering with um, my daughter's drama school um, which actually teaches them to sing and dance and is wholly dependent on a kind of physical um, relationship with, with their customers, um, to actually go online. I've been spending a lot of my spare time editing videos of you know, the tutors doing their lessons at home in their own homes, in their own living rooms, and editing them, put them in, into a brand context, and then putting them into a YouTube site and doing YouTube live sessions on Saturday mornings. And that's fundamentally changing the proposition that that little uh, drama school has and the way that it goes to its markets. And we're seeing lots of other examples of that going across commerce as well at this point in time. Unfortunately, we're also seeing the opposite. And you know, one of the big downsides of organizations not having a proper perspective on sustainability is the concept of the stranded asset. You know, at a, a large scale, this could be the construction of a dam that suddenly runs out of water. What we're seeing at this moment in time around COVID is the potential end of things like high street shops and things of that sort of nature, you know, when, which are not places that are good from an economic point of view going forward. So, you know, this framework for understanding how a sustainability lens on the way that we go to market with our businesses actually suddenly look very very tuned to the world we're in at this moment in time and yes you can see it from the negative perspective but also coming back to that 7.1 trillion opportunity if you can start thinking through some of these things in a proactive way it also gives us the starting of a framework to think about how actually sustainability can benefit us in the future so hopefully you can start to see how the business case for sustainability starts to come about um, but in that, that context, um, we need to start understanding how well digital has been doing from a, a sustainability perspective. So I've been talking um, for a little bit now uh, without hearing any input from you guys. Um, so in the chat box, I'm going to ask you a few questions. And in the, uh, the chat box, if you can give me some answers, it's going to be a, a nice litmus test on where we are uh, going forward from here. So. How many of you know, without quickly looking it up on Google, what the UN SDGs actually are? And I can't actually see the chat, um, Jack. So um, I don't know if you're seeing any answers come in there. 
Um, let's have a look here. So the chat says nope, nope. Um, so Emma says no, Edna says no, Mark says no, I no. Sorry, Tom Pearson, right? not me. Um, Ross and sustainable development goals. Oh, well done, Ross. Excellent. <laughs> um, Nick, sustainable development goals, but don't know what they are off by heart. Excellent. Uh, that's, to be honest, that's what I expected. So oh, they are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They were written. Rosson used to work for the UN. He said. Who did? Mm. Who Rosson, used to... Rosson Rusev. He said he used to work for the UNDP. That's cheating. <laughs> excellent, excellent, great, great to have you on board. But yes, they are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And oh, there we go. Um, and there are seventeen of them. Um, so actually. Based on that response, I think my next question is going to be quite interesting as well. So, hold on, I seem to have lost my ability. What percentage of the UK are aware of the, of the SDGs, do you think? So Edward says three, Mark Hammond 0.5%, Emma <laughs> says 5%, Priscilla 1. Okay. Richard not says less quite, than 1%. Not quite that bad. It's actually, uh, according to the United Nations survey last year, about 15% of the UK are aware of them and could, uh, I think like Ross said, knew what they were, but couldn't articulate all 17 of them. Um, now, we're doing quite poorly in the UK because that survey also looked at who was doing well. And 85% of people in India know about the sustainability goals. So I think there's a little bit of a UK challenge to go on there to make sure these things come to the top of our agenda. But they were written at a global level in 2016 um, with targets to be delivered by, um, by 2030. Now, um, there's in total 169 core KPIs that come out of those 17 goals. Um, so my final question before we move on, of those 169 targets that come out of those 17 goals how many do you think relate to digital we're waiting for them to come through yeah i think personally two nikki thinks five mark two ruben 10 alex about 20 charles says 50 Mashud says five joris 45 sarah 10 Okay, some good guesses. I'm afraid you're all, a little, you're all a little bit off. It's actually 103. Now, the definition of digital here is probably broader than the one we would collectively use on this goal. It includes all of ICT, but we are part of that mix. And I think, you know, we all, it, and I'm not, it's not a surprise, I'm not saying we're all being terrible on this call. It's just something that actually we should all be far more aware of and understand what we should be doing to maybe contribute to those goals, but also what it might mean is going to come our way from our corporate environments and colleagues in supply chain and manufacturing. And we'll dive into that a little bit more as we go forward. But what we can't do at this moment in time, especially on this call, um, is use 17 development goals and 103 KPIs to assess digital performance, because we'd be here for a lot longer than an hour. Um, so in the interest of keeping things simple, um, what I've done is just um, taken those um, 17 and we've bucketed them into kind of three broad areas of environmental impact, social impact, and economic impact, which is often a way many corporates kind of try to um, bubble up these individual goals. And over the next few slides, I'm going to dive in um, to where I've been able to find out digital is doing in each of those areas. Um, the thing I'll say before I go in there, there's two things I'll say. One, I've deliberately found the eye-opening stats, uh, but as I said before, they're, um, they're all fully referenced and I can share all those references afterwards. Um, the more important point, however, is that quite often I couldn't find anything that was specific to digital. And I think that's a gap and something as a collective um, running a, a very important industry, um, we need to actually start to improve and get better at. So let's look at our environmental impact at this moment in time. So starting at a macro level, starting at a bigger, big level, um, 
digital marketing as part of overall technology in ICT um, is predicted to make up almost a quarter, 23% of global electricity usage by 2030. So that means our global carbon footprint that we're complicit in actually making is actually pretty significant. And we should take a perspective on that and understand through our own activities, how can we actually start to bring that carbon, carbon footprint down? In a similar macro level um, consideration, um, e-waste, this is the thrown away of old technologies and obsolete technologies, is now the world's largest and fastest growing waste stream and actually is the, one of the most polluting with some of the heavy chemicals and, and kind of toxins actually come out of old kit. Um, so, you know, 2018, 48.5 million tonnes of e-waste was thrown away and that was predicted to grow in the double digit figures um, over 2019 and in 2020. Now, you can argue that we're a little bit removed from that, but as we try to drive forward our functionality and our services and the things that we do, we actually accelerate tech obsolescence. So always by trying to add the new bit of functionality, the new killer app, we're trying to leverage the new capabilities of technology. That's great, it's exciting and it's innovative, but we also have to be aware that actually we're accelerating the redundancy of kit. And actually that has this impact from an e-waste perspective. From a carbon miles point of view, you know, one of the things that you know, digital and e-commerce in particular has been fantastic at doing is actually driving global markets, allowing small companies to sell their products across the world. And in fact, e-commerce account, you know, cross-border e-commerce is about 20% of the, the global e-commerce industry and it's growing as a percentage. Now, obviously that has a massive impact on carbon miles. I caught myself out a few years ago as part of my cycling passion, um, buying you know, really cool and trendy cycling jerseys, if there is such a thing, um, from Australia. And actually shipping a jersey all the way from Australia just so I could wear it on my bike and look cool. And being a mammal, you never look cool on a bike anyway. So why I bothered in the first place, I don't know. But I've stopped myself doing that sort of thing, but it's all too easy in, in e-commerce to actually do that sort of purchase. Probably more critically, and maybe something you, some of you guys are already thinking about, but actually last mile delivery of e-commerce is expected to grow by 78% by 2030, with a huge impact on congestion with cities um, and carbon footprints within cities. In particular, um, that gets really important when we do rush deliveries, when we have impatient customers that want to delivery the same day or delivery the next day. Any um, ben environmental benefit by having a e-commerce purchase versus a traditional retail purchase is offset by that speed. And actually the speed of getting that product to that impatient customer means that the actual carbon footprint of that purchase is worse than actually having a traditional retail shop. Packaging is obviously a fairly obvious one. Um, you know, in the US alone, 165 million packages or 1 billion trees were shipped just purely in the US. Now, again, you might say, that's part of my supply chain, that's part of my organization, another division that does that. But how we build our propositions with things like e-commerce, how we say, you can only have this when you've got a bigger bundle of things coming to you, you know, and how we can mi minimize the packaging and how often we send out our um, goods um, can be impacted by the way we build our propositions going forward if we start to think about them from a sustainable point of view. Coming down now to more direct impacts that we may have more control over but aren't necessarily thinking about. And we're thinking about our marketing activation or our kind of media activations or CRM activations. And I found it really, really hard here to find data to prove how good or bad we actually were. There is a group that's come together that's called DIMPACT, um, which is a collaboration between the organizations you see there, BBC, Dentsu, Aegis Group, ITV, TalkTalk, Talk, Sky, and the University of Bristol to actually collectively work together to map the carbon footprint 
of the tech media, digital media content services. It's a very complex thing to understand because you, you breach into other different impacting areas like electricity consumption in the home and things of that nature. But there is a bit of work going on by Dimpact to actually map that. It was only announced last year and there's no output to come from that organization yet. But hopefully at some point in time, we'll start to get some sort of insight onto what our carbon footprint is collectively at that industry level. But that's just a start. What does that then uh, allow us to start thinking or allow us to start planning? You know, how do we, it's going to be bad news. So how do we start bringing it down? And what are the impacts on our own activations and the way we think about activations? So to give you an idea, one calculation I was able to do was to look at a typical um, email CRM uh, campaign. So your average carbon footprint of an email with an attachment is around about 50 grams of carbon. And your, our current UK average response rates to an email campaign for a consumer packaged good is circa 14.5, 14.7%. So you bring those two facts together for a 10,000 mail campaign. And actually with a 14.5% um, open rate or success rate, it actually means that that email shot to 10,000 people will have wasted about 400 to 420 kilograms of carbon, which I was staggered by because I've sent many, many campaigns over the years to databases in far excess of 10,000. And if you start multiplying that number up at an industry level, you can start to see that we are having a massive impact. If you extend it beyond just email and start thinking about ad placements, programmatic digital placements, display media, and the whole content marketing movement, things get even worse. At the moment, your average click-through rate on all sorts of display ads across all ad formats is just 0.05. Even if those ad placements only have 0.01 carb and grams of carbon um, impact, by the time you add those billions of placements a day, a week, a year together, you're starting to see a significant amount of carbon wastage that's coming out of our activations. In addition to that, if you start looking at production, especially where you've got marketing strategies, social media, uh, content marketing strategies, I should say, especially around social media. Some markets report a 60% inefficiency rate there, where 60% of content they've created is not actually used. I actually did some consulting, uh, brief consulting with a, a fashion house that I won't name um, last year, who were already making 30,000 pieces of content a year, of which 30% they knew they never used. They were asking us to figure out how they could actually get that to circa 80,000 pieces of content, which obviously, when you think about the produ sheer production costs of that, um, is an inherently wasteful thing. So from an environmental point of view, we have things to actually consider. Um, and if anybody wants to challenge these or come in on these, please do, please do. From a social impact, and I'll pick up the pace a, a little bit now, um, this is looking at how the things we do impact communities and the social world and social society that we look in. Most of you will already know about the digital divide, uh, and despite the huge um, prevalence of the internet and digital technologies around the world, there's still only two thirds of the population has in access to the internet. So by not being able to get to those other individuals, um, we are actually kind of being inequitable in the way that the value of digital is being distributed around the world. And that's not just a you know, developed country versus poor country. It's not just about the fact there's no internet in certain, markets, certain countries within Africa. We also have to think about that within our own countries and our own societies. So within the UK last year, only 29% of individuals over 65 years old actually transacted online. And we've seen that become a very big problem in COVID, where elderly individuals were unable to start shopping online or struggled to start shopping online. So actually, you know, that inequity of 
how we get individuals that are in vulnerable groups to be able to use these services became very critical for those individuals trying to get their food as we went through COVID. In a similar way, you know, and this is purely thinking it from a financial point of view, 90% of the world's largest um, digital companies, well, 70 of the largest digital company, companies, their value, the revenue, the income, the profit goes into the US and into China. We've heard many stories about you know, the, the tax that companies do or don't pay in their operating markets, such as Facebook and Google and, and people of that sort of thing. You know, that impacts um, society because that wealth isn't distributed fairly around the world. Coming down from the macro level again, more to the sorts of things we'll be doing on our day-to-day -day basis, system bias has started to creep into our worlds as we've increasingly started using data-driven techniques, increasing application of AI technologies that are driven by algorithms, many of them which are becoming automated, um, has introduced an increasing level of bias that we never meant to put in there, but is actually becoming something that we're being criticised for. You know, um, I think it was LinkedIn that was famously criticised for not propose, um, promoting senior level jobs to females on the platform. Uh, and that was simply because the algorithm they were using said, you only need to highlight these um, very senior high paid roles to individuals that are very senior in high paid roles already. And because of the current inequity we have from a sexual point of view, um, sexual point of view, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come across well. Um, you know what I mean. Um, because of the current inequity between kind of payment between men and women in the UK, it meant that many women weren't being told about these ads that were actually there for them to apply to. Yeah, Harvard on. Business Review also did a study in looking at e-commerce algorithms and actually um, spotted that you know higher net worth individuals were being shown more um, discounted promotions. Um, than less affluent individuals. So we're bringing system bias into the way we commute, which has obvious ramifications within the social communities. The other thing we need to be um, more aware of is the way that we use data and orchestration engines and decisioning platforms and all the technologies at our, uh, at our command to actually personalise for the individual. You know, I and most of us think that's a brilliant thing. It allows us to understand when an individual's right to buy something and we can deliver the right message at the right time, the right format for them to run off and actually buy our product. Great, but actually those technologies are potentially becoming more damaging than they are useful. There's a great article on The Guardian from a, a year ago about the morphing into surveillance capitalism, um, which is an argue arguable point but actually, it's very easy to see how that personalization is starting to draw user ex uh, destroy user experiences and it's stimulating things like fake news and clickbait. My personal example of that, um, which also talks to the next point about kind of lower levels of trust and price fairness that customers are starting to see because of these personalization techniques, is, is actually the way that um, my partner actually books our holidays. So she will actually research where we go on holiday on her machine and do all the, the, the kind of researching in the hotels and the flights and all that sort of stuff. But because it's known that actually if you don't buy it straight away, cookies will kick in and actually prices will go up. She actually doesn't buy anything from that machine. She waits till she goes to her mother's house and actually goes on and books the trip on her mother's PC which allows, her, allows us to get the cheaper prices. If we take that step back and think about that as a user experience, those technologies we're using to personalize but also kind of dynamically price are destroying that user experience. In that I don't buy online, I actually leave my house, go to another house to get the price I actually want to get. That is not a good user experience. And all this is combining to the final point here around trust. Um, at the moment, the advertising industry is at an all time low in sort of trust. We're down below used car salesmen as around the 25%. But 
Um, and I don't know how many of you have seen the Gaslighters articles that came out on the back of COVID, much of which point at the overselling, the overcommercialization of the internet. And actually, when I read that, I actually felt myself that I was potentially acting as one of the gaslighters in some of the digital marketing uh, that I've been doing over the years. And I think if you haven't read those um, letters, those open letters um, that came out of an individual from the US, they're a good thing to get your head into and they're a bit of a, oh, an eye opener and um, wake her upper. Quickly moving on to economic now, which is where we should be a little bit more comfortable in these sorts of conversations. Um, Things that um, COVID's done that we would see from other system level changes are things like the massive acceleration in what we need to do. Um, COVID has accelerated digital hugely. You know, Satella Dalla from uh, Nadella from Microsoft saying that in the last two months, digital has accelerated to a point where the progression has been what you would normally expect to see within two years. Um, how we all collectively respond to that, how the agility of our businesses collectively respond to that is something that we're going to have to figure out if that becomes the new norm. At the same time, and prior to COVID, there was a big change in the board in the C-suite, and it was something I was doing some research into at the time as well, which is actually the growth of purpose within organisations. Um, the FT reporting that actually this was now the lead thing on corporate agendas. And actually Fjordnet there as well, actually saying that actually um, the corporate focus, the C-suite focus was finally gonna switch from digital to purpose, which us as digital marketeers and, and you know, digital practitioners should have been a bit of a warning site that actually we were becoming less important. Now I think COVID has replaced us back on the board. Uh, and replaced us back on that agenda because there's a definite expectation that digital can help us out of the COVID world, but it needs to be done within the context of the board thinking about purpose and thinking about sustainability. Sustainability also brings with it a change in leadership. Um, you know, leadership over the last few years has got very short term. The average tenure of CEOs come down from seven years down, down to sort of something like three or four years. And often those CEOs come in with a particular skill set, such as cost saving or acquisition or something like that, that allows them to come in, do their job, be very successful and go on to the next one. Um, that's driven increasing acceleration in reporting, three month reporting windows. Digital as well has helped change this by doing things like rapid um, activation campaigns and things of that nature so we can do things in real time. However, sustainability leadership needs to take a step back and is more long-term in its view of the world. So we need to figure out how we behave in that world and how we move beyond just performance into things like purpose and actually into things like participation, which is not just um, a concept for how leadership behaves within an organization, but actually within society and within the broader community. Um, I'm going to move on quickly now because I'm, I'm conscious of time. But actually, what else? The other things that are happening from an economic point of view are a rising importance of different types of business models. So things like shared value and circular economies, which move us beyond the kind of manufacture, use, throw away approach to many businesses and many industries at the moment, to ones where there's a repeatable nature in the purpose in the 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 value cycle or a shared purpose in the value cycle. And this changes the way that companies and organizations start to behave. And then my final one, where I'm trying to be deliberately provocative here, is around about the role of marketing and where marketing is currently uh, in the global scheme of things within the corporate. And is there a risk that marketing itself and digital marketing itself could become a bit of a stranded asset in these new worlds? First and foremost, if you look at what's happening under COVID, um, commerce isn't being driven by uh, abundance anymore. We're not trying to weigh for attention anymore. People are driven to purchase by a fear of scarcity. And actually, all they want to know is, where can I buy my toilet rolls? Where can I get my flour? And things of that nature. So actually, you know, because demand is throttled, it's changed the way that consumers are actually purchasing. 
and all marketing is about the opposite. So how we operate in that world um, is something we need to think about. And arguably, there's less of a role for us if demand is, if scarcity is driving demand rather than the other way around. Um, the other thing that we're seeing, um, or it's been exposed somewhat, is my example there earlier with that video about the only way for brands to respond in these scenarios is with a, a fairly thinly veneered um, brand video that we're here for you without actually an ability to step in and do something different and actually contribute, contribute to society by changing what manufacturing is or making offers that help key individuals. You know, many companies get branded um, with the label of um, greenwashing with these sorts of things. And if that's all marketing is able to do at this moment in time, then that's going to be increasingly less important um, for the corp. Uh, boards because they're going to get operations to change what they do or things of that nature or they're going to or HR are going to engage the employees to go out and make the changes that actually do make participation within these scenarios. Um, the other one as well I would say is that despite all our technologies, all our data and our ability to actually track performance of our campaigns, when you take a step back there's still a very opaque effectiveness of some of those technologies. It's very hard to dive in and really understand what's going on in certain areas of media, such as programmatic and things of that sort of nature. And actually, are we really improving response rates? I did some reading of some very old 1980s marketing reports to see what sort of response rates companies were getting out of their direct mail campaigns and activation campaigns at that point in time. And actually, the numbers were very similar to the numbers you're seeing today. So even with all our technologies and all our capabilities, have we actually moved our effectiveness forward? Um, one of the stats I've been using a little bit effectively is that if you were to go into a production or manufacturing or operations scenario and say that you were, um, you were 95% inefficient in what you were doing, you would not be able to succeed in that role. Yet marketing is still able to do that in some of the things that it actually does. And where's been the dramatic change in innovation that's actually allowed us to take our response rates from single digits up into the high 90s or in, into the high top quartiles. And finally, there's a real genuine sense amongst you know, many in the sustainability community that actually the pursuit of the individual, which has been at the heart of business for so many years, the customer is always right, actually hampers true innovation. Because if you purely look at what the individual wants, you don't see what's happening in society, you don't see what's happening in a broader context, and therefore you don't allow those impacts to actually inform your innovation going forward. You know, people often quote Apple in this scenario to say that nobody asked for an iPhone. Um, and it's true. And I think what marketing's arguably been doing with its use of data is actually honed more and more in on the individual and stopped thinking in a more broader societal level to actually inform its innovation going forward. So um, I've been going on for a while there. I hope that's stimulated a few things, a few thoughts across everything there. Um, anything particular coming up, Jack? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So we've got um, Charles. So he said, OK, so e-commerce shipping packaging must pale into insignificance versus the overall product packaging used. Plus, it can more often be sustainable or recycled than regular plastic packaging. Not saying it isn't necessary to reduce waste in e-commerce shipping, too. Yes, it does pale in, in significance, apart from in some scenarios, like I said, when you've got um, rush charges and things going on, which is more the carbon input than the packaging impact. Um, yes, it, it does. And actually, a lot of technologies are actually put up there as ways to actually mitigate and actually do a better job from the environment versus traditional things. Um, I suppose the challenge there is, is that as that grows, um, you have to be careful that you don't get lazy with it and just allow it to grow when you should be trying to optimize at every opportunity and every point you know there's a um 
there's a great um, sustainability writer called Mike Berners-Lee, uh, nothing to do with Tim's Berners-Lee, um, who talks about squeezing the balloon and rebound effects. And actually, you know, he looks at technologies that have, such as conference call technologies um, that actually allow people to talk and communicate and have business relationships and avoid the need to actually travel. And he says, that's great, that's brilliant. But actually, what you find is when you look at the data, those conference calls facilities trigger more business relationships, which actually end up in more flights anyway. So even though um, packaging at e-commerce is better than have, typically better than having the full retail experience and things of that nature, as it grows and becomes bigger, you know, I think it was the um, 160 billion trees is something we should try to bring down anyway. Otherwise, we just let that become a problem until that then becomes an unsustainable um, solution. Um, we've also got Guy. So Guy says, does individual content, ads, etc., have an incremental cost? Or is it at the cost of the daily cost of hosting the internet divided by the number of pages and videos, etc.? Run that by me again. Sorry, Jack. So he said, does individual content, ads, etc., have an incremental cost or is it at the cost of the daily cost of hosting the internet divided by the number of pages videos etc yeah you'll have a you know from your own platform you'll have the cost of hosting which obviously has a which has a carbon footprint but many of the big hosting companies are starting to use the the data centers that are using renewable energies and things of that sort of nature um, at the same time you know, I suppose there's two uh, further arguments on that. One, if you're delivering more pieces of content um, that aren't getting responses or aren't um, performing well, then actually you're wasting carbon anyway by just delivering them in the first place. When if you could find ways to get your performance up so you don't have to deliver them, you're not going to be wasting that impact. Um, the other point is actually more around the production of content. Um, so if you're um, commissioning editors, commissioning writers, sending people on photo shoots and that whole agency production, which has become huge over the last few years. Um, I mean, when I was at Axe and Abel, we were publishing 400 um, articles a month that were then transcreated into 57 different markets. And, and I still couldn't tell you today how many of those articles were actually read. Um, but the sheer production of doing that um, has an impact as well. Um, so the next one's from Emma. What's the best way in your experience to consider the environmental when making marketing decisions and executions? Can I cut? That's where I want to go. Yeah. Can I come on to that as we get back on? Because that's really where I want to go next. I'm kind of a little bit conscious of time as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so but, but brilliant question. I mean, I think what all this starts to say is that um, arguably marketing's on a little bit of thin ice here. So what do we actually do to go forward, and how do we improve going forward? And what I was going to do in the next two slides is start building out some frameworks for that, and, and I'll rattle through these quite quickly to get onto that example we talked about. Um, first and foremost, I think it's about us becoming more self-aware. And there are numerous um, analysis tools and frameworks you can actually use to start doing that in each of those areas of environment, social and economic. And if anybody wants me to share more information on that, I can um, definitely after the call follow up on that. But these are tools and mechanisms, reporting infrastructures you can use to actually become more self-aware of what you're doing. Some of, your, of you will have um, sustainability leads within your organization that might be doing some of this. So talk to those individuals. In other areas, we might have to wait for things like DIMPAC to come back before we actually have any sort of uh, methodology before we can actually do that sort of analysis. But becoming self-aware will we'll, we'll put you in this scenario, um, which is what the other industry, the depart other divisions like supply chain and manufacturing have found is that you can look at environment, society, social impacts and economic impact separately, but they never remain separate. They all start to overlap and they all start to impact each other. And the only way to actually start mitigating and improving performance 
often becomes by taking that holistic view. And only by taking that holistic view can you actually start bringing proper resilience into the system. Um, now that becomes highly complicated. You have the concept of cascading dominoes where you find one thing, you knock that over, but that's dependent on another thing and that's dependent on another thing. Um, so you have to be able to take your organization back to a place where you can start thinking at this system level. And this is where purpose really starts to become important because you've got a lot of moving parts that are suddenly in your head that you need to orchestrate. And only by putting a purpose at the heart of those things can you actually start to get a, to think about how you might orchestrate things to actually build out programs that deliver on all those elements and give you that complete sense of resilience across what you're doing. And that purpose requires a different way of thinking as well. Um, and bought, born out really out of three different um, facets, I should say, to actually build that up. First of all, as I've already talked about, you need to bring in new levels of leadership. And I think that's great for us as digital leaders because we have often brought in the idea of a new vision or a destination for what we want to do from a digital point of view. We've had to bring together different divisions across the organization to do alignment and break down traditional silos. And we've had to be dependent on third party agencies and experience to actually help us do these things. Um, but we need to do that at a bigger scale now going forward. But it also requires us to start thinking at a different level. Rather than thinking product, do we think service? How do we think about our business models? Do we think about shared value business models? Do we think about how do we operate in a circular economy where we do manufacturing, we do um, selling, we do usage, we do reacquisition of the product, we do parts harvesting, we bring it into the equation. How does digital facilitate those sorts of business models? And that requires us to be massively innovative. We argue at the moment digital is very good from an incremental innovation, but what radical new disruptive innovations do we need to bring in place to actually make these things happen? I was going to go into Microsoft to talk about how they've done that, but I'd really recommend you look at, in the interest of time, I'll skip this, um, really recommend that you look into what they've been doing to transform their business around purpose and how not only has this allowed them to say things, they will be carbon negative by 2030, um, but at the same time, they've massively re reinvigorated their business, brought new products to service like, um, not like their cloud-based services and things of that sort of nature and things like AI for Earth. Um, and it's really invigorated Microsoft going forward. So thoroughly recommend you look at that. There's a brilliant document they've published, which is their sustainability report on the back of their service product, which is a phenomenal piece of work. And it really shows you the level of depth you need to go in to make sure that you engineer sustainability into the heart of the product right from the design stage going forward. What I wanted to do, coming back to that question about understanding our impact at the moment, was um, to actually take a challenge. So Microsoft has said that it will be carbon negative by 2030. Now, that's a competitive challenge internally, but also to other big tech companies. So what would we have to do if that mandate was applied to your organization? Say your CEO mandated that it, the company, your company will be carbon negative by 2030. And one of the things it was going to do to drive the various divisions within your organization to work towards that goal was to apply an internal carbon tax to drive behaviors. It's something that Microsoft did with its own employees. So whenever there's a uh, activity or an operation within your organization that has a carbon footprint, um, that needs to be quantified and a carbon tax will be applied internally within the business to um, the cost of that activity. Which is a way that Microsoft has approached it with its internal travel with its em employees. But if we try to do that to our direct marketing and marketing activities, digital marketing activation and activities, we see quite already there's some big challenges come our way. Firstly, how do we identify how big that problem is? How would we identify what our carbon, current carbon footprint is? As we already talked about, understanding that from our own assets and our own websites, 
we could talk to our electricity companies or our hosting companies to understand were they green, what were the carbon footprints of our activities. That's not too much of a challenge. But when it came to our display media or our communications activities, agency or something of that nature, would they be able to give you that sort of insight? I doubt it at this moment in time. Would your production agency, would your creative agency or your kind of actual production agency be able to give you a report on the back of their scope of work saying how much the carbon footprint of this actual project would actually cost? I doubt it very much as well. But even if you could equate all that, um, you know, what would the impact of that be on your current activities? If you added a carbon tax to your media, for example, would that add 20% to the cost of your media? And what would the subsequent impact be on your ability to deliver against your commercial objectives be? Um, once you've got that sort of insight, that self-assessment, self-awareness, you'd then start to think, okay, where is the opportunity to save? With your hosting, can you shift to renewable energy services? Can you make sure your media partner or you know is actually working with um, vendors that are operating from renewables point of view but actually if we can't can we reduce volume actually rather than doing that 10,000 mailing can we actually reduce that down to a, tw a 2,000 mailing but massively pump up our response rates so we get the commercial benefit out of it but we've actually reduced the carbon footprint out of that and then also can we therefore take that thinking to what we produce and only produce the content that we actually need? Once you start asking yourself those questions, you start seeing that there's actually quite a transformation needed in the way that we have to think about um, our activation strategies and approaches. Um, assuming we can do some of that, that might mitigate some of our carbon footprint, but it won't solve it. So then what can we do to actually offset what's left? Can we ask our customers, to pay for some sort of offsetting service. Every time you visit our website, we will pay for a tree to be planted. Every time you click on one of our ads, we'll pay for a tree to be planted or something of that nature. Um, um, Jack and I both know an individual that's helping run a business that every time you schedule a meeting, they will plant a tree for you. So those sorts of services are already coming up already, but where are they within the media world? And once you've done all that, how do you then report it? How do you gather that data in? How do you benchmark that data? How do you build that into your, report, your reporting and your dashboarding so you can actually say, we placed this media, we got this response rate, and we only had this carbon, this carbon footprint going forward. And how do you answer the questions that come out from the board on that? And then, once you're doing all that, you're gonna to want to communicate it and take it to market. So actually, you know, how do you make your carbon footprint visible to your customers and your users? an individual to your website, do they get a carbon calculator sitting in the corner of the screen telling them how much carbon they're using by staying on the site? Do you actually work within the media industry to actually say, um, when I'm delivering an ad placement, I want to make sure that potential customers know that actually that ad is being served by renewable energies, so it's got a little green certification mark in the bottom right-hand corner of it. How would you get to a place where you're able to deliver that and you've got the certification and the, and the processes in place to enable you to legitimately put that there. Now what you can see is that's all a significant amount of work that's not just dependent on you but is dependent on other agencies, depending on the digital um, world actually changing the way that it thinks about what it does from a sustainability point of view and actually puts a big question mark in some of the activities as if we were to have that visibility would we carry on doing what we're doing or actually would it genuinely drive innovation where we can start to properly avoid doing those sorts of things in the, in the first place? Arguably, we have some of the technologies already. We have things like addressable audiences. So how can we better use them, better use data to really only communicate with individuals that are genuinely going to respond to us and take the waste out of it that way? Or is there a disruptive innovation that we can actually start driving through that completely mitigates the need to do these processes at all? Something that arguably marketing should have been doing, that digital media should have been doing, but it's got tied up in this incremental improvements rather than these disruptive innovations going forward. So Jack, I'm conscious of time uh, and I wanted to work through this challenge because hopefully it kind of stimulated some thinking. 
any thoughts coming in? What are people's thoughts on time? Because we're a bit over at the moment. Yeah, there's quite a few. So um, let's go back here. Um, so is the full virtual life the logical conclusion? And then in brackets, ready player one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? Is the full virtual life the logical conclusion? I, I think that was in response to a previous, I think that was a while ago. Uh, oh, here's one, here's one. So the amount of tech waste was shocking. How do we make the tech giants accountable for ensuring the public um, disposal of this waste responsibly? Especially as we update tech continually, making a, a desktop useful for a couple of, couple of years at best. What, yeah. is, what is in place at the moment? Yeah, I mean, um, fully agree on that one. And I would really recommend, I'll send out a link to this afterwards, the, the, um, the sustainability report that Microsoft have done on the back of their devices division, um, where they really lean into this. And it's all about uh, getting sustainability built in at the design stage. So at the design stage, you're building for a circular model. So what's been brilliant about the Surface products, for example, is that they... Um, at the design stage built in the concept of a circular economy so a lot of the a lot of the, the nastiness that's in our technologies are things like uh, lithium and cobalt and things of that nature which are massively wasted of water you know that massive impact on the environment yet there's so much e-waste now in landfill that actually microsoft's exploring technologies to, to harvest from landfill so you're harvesting the, com the cobalt and the lithium from old devices, reprocessing it and using that in your new ones. But that requires you to think about the design of your new surface model to be able to take in those older kind of um, um, sources of, of raw material. Um, so they go through this whole thing about how you have to build in circular usage right from the start. Um, but to the point, it's still in the interest of driving another purchase and a new product. Um, so how do we actually make us last longer with our devices is a societal play. You know, how we actually, society says, no, I don't want a new Mac every year. I want a new Mac every five years. Or um, the automotive industry is a great one at this level. Um, and there's been some great work being done by lease plan, the, the car, um, uh, leasing service to actually say actually let's not just think about the aesthetics and the pleasure of owning and driving in the way we market cars let's th think about it from a kind of community impact point of view and say when should you have a new car in your community and actually there's more than enough four by fours in your community at the moment so we're not going to sell you one you know there's these broader societal um, pressures where we need to think outside of just selling in the way we've done before, more into these social sharing, shared value sorts of models that can work. So in other words, what's the best way in your experience to convince clients to consider the environmental when making marketing decisions? Really good question. Uh, and I wish I had the complete answers to that. The answer is going to be in demonstrating the economic impact of actually doing that. And that's why I wanted to talk through this challenge here, which was to say, if you were to be able to put a carbon cost on your marketing activities uh, as a way of saying, what is the real value of what, what is the real cost of what we're doing? Um, then it starts to kind of surface in an economic and financial way, um, what impact we're actually having and therefore drive new behaviors. But this is where I think the industry has to change. I think, um, as Jack, you and I have talked about, and yeah. some of my closing slides talk to, um, our industry institutions like the Marketing Society and people like that aren't giving us the thought leadership to actually um, drive some of these things. You know, some of those ideas need to be industry level benchmarks. You know, is there an industry level threshold that um, this community did that says that if your effectiveness is less than 25%, then that campaign shouldn't be run because the carbon impact is too much. 
and I'm making that up. I'm not suggesting that by any sort of imagination, but only get into a place where you're able to demonstrate the commercial impact. Are you able to get to that sort of place? And there's new models that are coming out, and the quickly um, jump forward. Actually, um, I was going to talk through this, but I've completely run out of time. The new growth models there, um, piece of thought leadership work done by the Forum for the Future around the five capitals model, which is natural, human, social, manufactured, and financial. And many companies like Sky and BT and Unilever are starting to report at using this model now, where you actually have a financial or economic articulation of your natural cost, your human cost, your social costs, and your manufactured costs. And operations, supply chain, manufacturing are starting to get heads around that now. Um, but from a marketing point of view, I would argue that we're way behind the curve on that. But if you were able to, if we were able to take the strategic capacity of marketing to be able to operate across those different growth models, then it would start to answer some of those questions coming out. Any more questions there, Jack? Yes, so another one is, um, how do you guarantee the belief in certification, so green, bio, sustainable? Many certificates are bought by companies and th therefore doubted for their reliability. No, they are. Uh, it's, it's a really good um, question and a very good challenge, to be perfectly honest. Um, certification marks are only... Um, the validity comes out of how rigorous they actually are and what um, standing they have in a community or in a society. Um, the, a number of the fishing certification marks, as an example, have come under massive criticism because the way that they do their auditing is not as rigorous as they pretend it to be. And there's sort of some of the certification processes in, in fishing are coming under massive criticism for that. And again, that's where we need our industry level bodies to actually step up and build the credibility in some sort of scheme that will be adopted to. Um, but there will only be a proof point at any point in time. Uh, I used to work at British Standards Institution, so we had things like the Kite Mark, I said 9000 and things of that nature. They become a hygiene level, they become a benchmark reason to believe. Um, that we get, you have to do, you know, at some point in the future as a mandatory. Um, our marketing, our activities will always need to step up above that, and that's where our reporting will need to come in and our ability to demonstrate and actually show um, to our customers and our stakeholders what we're genuinely doing. Um, another one is what would your crystal ball show in terms of specific services or features? to exist in the future that would support digital resilience, sustainability, and UN's SDGs while being attractive con to consumers? And the second part of the question is, how would those services affect brand loyalty? Well, I think, th this is where I think the whole sustainability movement is massively positive, because um, they're approaching it from this idea of building out new models that allow business, society, and the environment to succeed. So, you know, if marketing evolves its services in that vein, then by having a better social uh, repu reputation, by doing better for the environment and being more um, efficient in your communications, your brand has got to benefit. You know, I think by, you know, that's where resilience comes in, by being able to kind of show positive action and all those dimensions, you're going to build out stronger brands. To come back to the, the first part of the question though, there, there are new um, services and new guidance from new types of agencies. There's a couple of agencies out there now like BrandPi and people like this that are starting to get their head around sustainability. It's more in the communications at that CSR level but they're exploring you know, new ways to kind of build sustainability in. If I wanted to crystal ball gaze, um, what I would love to see is marketing where it used to be in the corporate environment and at the forefront of innovation, at the forefront of driving businesses forward, and actually 
marketing being at the forefront of sustainability. I think, you know, the skills we have as digital practitioners, our ability to weave environments and user experiences together uh, is a skill set that's massively valuable. I think we have tools like all our data capabilities at our disposal, which should be able to help us understand our impacts in a lot more granular detail and report on how well we're improving and how we optimize them more. Um, I often use the, the, the phrase uh, when we were studying saying, I think digital marketing has got a lot of the right tools. We've just got the hammer at the wrong end. Um, and actually, if we can turn some of those tools and some of those models to look at a sustainability um, dashboard or something of that nature, that can seriously help as well. In fact, one of the colleagues of mine on the Cambridge course is actually in a um, Tableau type, you know, dashboarding startup. And his commitment was to actually go away and build out sustainability dashboards using their new tools. So I think you'll start to see those sorts of services come out of the agency world and out of the agency models. But I think the, the, the hard work at the moment is in strategy and building the right strategic tools for marketing to do that. And um, one last question here. So have you any recommendations about the best sources of information or facilitation for a business switching to 100% renewable electricity supply? Um, not off the top of my head, but I can ask around and find out. Um, if you're looking for um, guidance on how to go with some of these things, there's the, the, the assessment models I talked about before. Um, I was going to quickly go into calls to action. Um, the Cambridge Sustainability Leadership Team have 10 tasks that you can get your, your head into, which is, I think is a lot. I think if you want to start getting your heads around what to do next, um, the first thing is, is get self-aware. Um, I would absolutely recommend anybody on this course, on this call to go and look at the um, Business Sustainability Leadership course at the Cambridge University. It is brilliant and it really starts to open your mind on, onto this. Um, but then start using some of these analysis models to get a perspective on what you're doing at this moment in time. Many of you in larger organizations will probably have somebody doing sustainability leadership within your company, probably in operations or something like that. Go and talk to them. Who are they? Who's advising them? It might be the big management um, consultancies and their sustainability teams. Um, but get yourself into those conversations. Um, so you start to get help from those conversations as well. I think we also need to then start leaning on our partners in the agency world. I spend a lot of time in, in the agency world and this conversation isn't there. But if we all start collectively saying to our media partners, as an example, um, I want to know the carbon footprint of this media activation campaign. At the moment, they wouldn't have a clue. But if we can start putting the pressure on so they start figuring that out, at some point they'll start turning that into a service that they'll start to <laughs> monetize uh, and drive forward. And the, the final one's a little bit of a, um, a, a call for help from myself, <laughs> really. Um, th this is a personal passion for me. I'm, I'm trying to drive a bit of thought leadership on this. Um, there's a group of us from, the, from Cambridge that are trying to get together some thought leadership. We might go and do some lobbying to some of the industry societies like the Marketing Society. Um, if anybody's aware of anything else going on, let me know. If anybody's interested in joining on that, or just wants to chat more about it, um, please, please, please get in touch. And I think marketing's got a lot to do in this space, but I think it's also uh, a massively exciting space for us all to get into personally. Excellent, so another couple of questions. Yep. Um, do you think COVID is a wake up call for businesses to find their purpose, especially in the boardroom? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, I think what you've seen is companies been knocked for six. I think you've seen um, model business models being knocked for six. I think you've seen um, the voice of society celebrate the kind of calmness that's come with business going quiet um, and actually the slowing down of things. So I think there's you've seen the economic impacts with business kind of going really, really quiet. You've seen the societal impacts and people being at home, more time with their families, living and breathing. And you've seen 
companies that have been heroed in that environment, being the ones that have actually rolled up the sleeves and actually done things and actually participated. You know, they've stopped manufacturing their old products, they've made new products, or they've changed their focus from manufacturing, you know, cosmetics to actually at manufacturing hand gels and things of that nature. You've seen those companies that actually demonstrate an a, a, not demonstrate behavior, actually do a behavior, uh, actually get participatory authority, have actually been the ones that have been heroed in this scenario. And the ones that have been best able to do that are the ones that have got a clear purpose. You know, people like Ecova, stuff like that, doing all their manufacturing going on to hand gels and stuff of that sort of nature. Microsoft with its focus on empowering the individual and pushing out its, um, you know, its conference um, facilities freely to schools and things of that nature. Their purpose has allowed them to very clearly say what they do to help. Um, there's a, another great uh, article done by Globescan uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago that analyzes those types of behaviors and actually benchmarks who's been doing well and who hasn't. And it looks at four collective groups of behaviors, whether it's philanthropy, collaboration, shared value development or um, adaption of business models um, but it talks from various case studies from people like Unilever and people like that so I'll make sure that's available as well. And another one here so is the need for double digit growth compatible compatible with purpose driven? Well, There's always I mean a very good question I mean I think um, not always and I think that's one of the things that where the strategic thinking of marketing needs to change. You can argue that marketing's built purely around growth. And actually, you know, as marketers and as data, digital marketers, it's very clear that growth is not infinite. Um, you know, as audiences become um, in attributable 100 percent attributable you should get we get to a point where we know what the ceiling is for our um audiences and consequently we know what the ceiling is for our growth so actually growth is going to be increasingly constrained by that as we go forward but then again the opportunity is in new definitions of growth if we just think about double digit growth from an economic point of view then yes there's, there's going to be a ceiling there but if you start thinking of human growth, natural capital growth, and you know, those five capitals model. Actually, you might be able to do double digit growth in human capital or in environmental capital if that's what the business is suddenly using to prove its success. How marketing delivers in human capital or environmental capital is not something I think many people has got its head around yet, and I, I definitely haven't. So, from a pure financial point of view, it, it might be incompatible. But as we start to bring in new definitions of what growth is, there could undoubtedly be the new areas, still areas for double digit growth. Are there any other question, guys? I think that's it, Paul. Brilliant. Thank you all for staying. I know I've gone on a bit long, but thank you all um, for staying on the call. Thank you so much, Paul. And guys, thanks a lot for coming to the webinar. Um, we have seven others, um, which go all the way up until Thursday next week. Um, but I hope you've got a really good, um, some really good information from Paul's webinar today. Um, there's some really good hints and tips there. So um, if you want to get in contact with him, he's all over LinkedIn. Um, so just type in Paul Randall and she can pop straight away. Um, alternative, and then alternatively, I'll put that in the uh, email for tomorrow. Um, along with any of the links that uh, Paul wants to put in. So thanks once again, guys, and thanks a lot, Paul. Thanks. Thanks all. Bye. Bye, everybody.